Kelly Sadler, and this is Politically Unstable. This week, we're joined with Representative French Hill, who sits on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And uh, this week, he penned a column for us talking about the potential national security threats that are coming through our wide open southern border. Um, Representative, thanks for joining us this week. Um, we just saw the passing of 9 11. Um, you know, everyone went to the memorials to pay their respects, one of the biggest terror events ever happening on U.S. soil. Um, but, but you say that there's potential for another attack, um, and that attack is, is our vulnerable southern border and, 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 you know, terrorists just basically walking across um, and, and, and plotting something against the American people. What, how big of a threat uh, do you see this as? Well, Kelly, thanks for having me. I think it's a significant threat, and that's why I wanted to uh, write this article for the American people and tie it to the horrible 23rd anniversary of 9-11. Since last fall, FBI Director Chris Wray has told Congress in open session uh, that he sees blinking lights everywhere and suggest that the terror threat level is as high as he can recall. He said in that testimony since 2014, many of us think uh, much higher than that going back to the 9-11 attacks and the House and Senate intelligence committees have just not gotten the level of information on a classified basis that would give us comfort that our uh, counterterrorism operation in the U.S. is at peak performance. And the reason why I'm so concerned about it is that we know about the encounters uh, that have been reported publicly having come across the southwest border. Uh, count encounters with people who are on the terror watch list, uh, encounters with those people either by a CBP or customs official at the border or a TSA agent at an airport. And I think it's just the tip of the iceberg when you have uh, publicly reported 9 million people in the country and millions of those are gotaways that enter the country and we have no visibility on them whatsoever. And finally, I would say recent news stories give public, uh, I think, clear dissemination to my concern, both in the Tazik arrests that have been made recently, the ISIS-related gang that was uh, uh, noted in the public reporting, and then even the rumor following President Trump's uh, horrific assassination attempt that perhaps someone who was a, a Pakistani was involved, and we've had uh, a real arrest last week, uh, last Friday, actually, a week ago, of a Pakistani on the Canadian border trying to come into the United States with probable cause that he was going to try to bomb a Jewish uh, community center in Brooklyn. So, you know, we hear reports about, you know, the Venezuelan gangs that are coming across the southern border. Uh, but you just brought up ISIS. Like, how many do you think that our enemies in the Middle East are using our southern border to, to cross and to penetrate this country, that it's not only, you know, the South American gangs. Yeah, I think it's important based on public reporting that you've seen in the press and that some of which I referenced in my opinion piece that Washington Times uh, published, that clearly uh, global terrorist watch list elements have entered the United States through our open porous borders. And we've also caught some and reported them and uh, done something about it. Uh, people, you know, an exhibit would be this uh, Pakistani at the Canadian border last week. That's good. That means that people are being attentive. But I'm concerned about the unknown unknowns when you have, as Don Rumsfeld would have said, because of this open porous border of people entering between the ports of entry, and I think we're at a, at a very dangerous time. And yes, you're right. Most of the press that is followed on this issue is, is rightfully about criminality of the drug cartels, the Venezuelan gangs, the Salvadoran gangs, uh, the transit of, of humans across the border between five and $10,000 each, making the cartels billions just in human trafficking, and the fentanyl. Uh, precursors that have come across the border or fentanyl manufactured across the border. And those are concerns. And I, I share those concerns completely and have 
voted every time I get a chance to correct that. But Biden and Harris have let this happen in the last three and a half years in an avalanche, catastrophic proportion. And I don't know why the media lets uh, the candidate for the Democrats off the hook on it, but I can assure you in Congress, this is what we talk about all the time. And it's not just because of our constituents telling us this is their top issue besides inflation and the economy. It's because we see this threat uh, in our Homeland Security Committee work, our HIPSI, our House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence work. And so that's why it's so concerning. So we saw, we all saw the public testimony of Christopher Ray, the FBI director, and when he said there's blinking lights and that he's very concerned about how porous the border is. Um, how has it been working with him? Because at all of these hearings, uh, you guys always request other information or, to, you know, supplement information. A lot of stuff is classified that we, the public, cannot see. But how has it been working with, you know, the DOJ and the Department of Homeland Security and, and getting the information that you need to assess the threat and then also hold these government agencies accountable in terms of, you know, apprehension and and arrests at the, at the border? Well, the short answer, Kelly, is very frustrating. And I say that uh, with all due respect, I don't want to be speaking for Chairman Mark Green of Tennessee of the Homeland Security Committee or Speaker uh, or uh, Chairman Mike Turner from Ohio of the Intelligence Committee. But we share this concern. And the response to your question is frustrating and not sufficiently responsive. Just this week, literally, uh, as my opinion piece went live on Washington Times on the <coughs> website and then published in the in the paper edition, I think Tuesday, uh, I was called down to the Intelligence Committee to say that you know an answer, a letter had been received that was uh, responsive to many of our requests, and I would describe it as a good start. But it's not fully responsive. And I would remind your listeners and your readers that these are requests that we made literally a year ago. We've started this process during 2023 and we intensified it, frankly, uh, not just because of the open border statistics, but because of Chris Ray's testimony in open mm -hmm. forum last fall. And so I mean, what what information are you requesting? What have you been given thus far and how yeah. are and how is the you know congressional branch going to hold the executive branch accountable? Well, we do have the tools to hold them accountable. And we we are. And that's uh, uh, I want to assure you that we are using all of our tools uh, available on that. And we can make that very, very painful uh, in the uh, Intelligence Committee uh, process. First, in the uh, Intelligence Authorization Act, which will be enacted into law a little later this year, we put in language requiring uh, the IC, the Intelligence Committee, led particularly by the FBI and the Homeland Security Committee, to tell us what their procedures are in every instance when they encounter someone associated with a terrorist group. Uh, at the point uh, at the border, at the uh, port of entry, in between ports of entry, and how they work together. Because one of the key points in the 9-11 Commission was the sharing and fusion of information between the intelligence community to protect the, the United States. And that's one of the gaps that I've seen here is that sharing and active uh, uh, working together in a timely way. And mm -hmm. so that'll be an element in our authorization uh, law this year. And also that's the focus of what we're doing. We've asked the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, uh, Green, Turner, and Hill have written them to assess independently of the FBI and others exactly how they work together to protect the American people from uh, terrorists or known or unknown terrorists, suspected terrorists that have entered the United States. How are they working together? We have a counterterrorism fusion center, one of the productive uh, aspects of the 9-11, post 9-11 commission report, but we want to put more focus on it to make sure it's actually delivering the results that we expect. Now, Kamala Harris says, you know, at first in 20, 2019, 2020, she wanted to 
defund or reconstitute what ICE does. Uh, she wants to decriminalize, you know, basically border crossings. She since backtracked through her aides saying that that's something that she doesn't want. And, and she puts the blame on Republicans for not passing a comprehensive border security bill. Would the bill that, you know, didn't get through the Senate would, would that have prevented these border crossings? Would it, would, it, would, it, would it solve that issue? What needs to be done congressionally, maybe through legislation, that, that strengthens you know, our security on the southern border? Well, I don't believe that the bill that she suddenly says that she's for, which was a compromise bill in the Senate, would have uh, impacted this really in any way. I think the uh, House Republican bill, H.R. 2, would have done more because it was a more comprehensive approach and contained many of the uh, strategies that President Trump was implementing during his first term in office, such as extending the border barrier, employing more border patrol, increasing the number of judges. But at the core of the H.R. 2 bill, the Republicans' uh, border security bill, you had this remain in Mexico, uh, tightening up the definition of seeking asylum, because basic, I would argue, and the statistics will be vary from a little bit of my point, but eight or nine out of 10 people presenting themselves before the border are using the magic words, I'm seeking asylum in the United States because I have credible fear of my own life or the life of my family in my home country. And okay. So we work on tightening that language, tightening the procedures around it. But the key element in the Department of Justice immigration law, as you well know from your work, uh, dedicated work in the, in the White House, is that uh, you must appeal for asylum from your country or a third country. And what presidents have done, but on steroids in the case of Biden, have just waived that and allowed people essentially to seek asylum at the border and come into our country to wait before they're deported. And a huge percentage just disappear yeah, into yeah, the fabric missing. of our society. So, you know, given you, you, the House passed H.R. 2, it was a strong bill, it died in the Senate. Um, is, you know, we're in an election season, in an election cycle, there's a lot of, you know, speculation that Republicans might take the Senate, might win the Senate narrowly, um, also could retain their majority, hopefully, in, in the House. If you have both sides, um, congressionally speaking, are you going to, is, is HR2 going to be reintroduced? Um, with the with the hopes that it will it will be taken up in the Senate, or or what is Congress going to do um, to let's just say let's just say that you know if Republicans win both houses, to it, we could either win or lose the presidency. But but this is an ongoing threat, and no matter who becomes president is going to be confronted uh, with this, and and hopefully we don't we don't have an, an attack before then. But but what can Congress do if Republicans win both houses to strengthen our board, even if Kamala Harris, let's say, wins the presidency? Yeah. Well, first, let me say, I hope that President Trump is reelected. I think on this point, I can't think of a, a stronger, more experienced um, person to be president. He's been tested here. You know how frustrating and tough it was. His first really almost three years in office trying to experiment, trying to learn about being president, trying to understand what the levers are that are legal and effective on the border, because it was something he campaigned on. I mean, it was his principal mm -hmm. A principal key issue in 16. So if President Trump is reelected and we have the House and Senate, you'll have a dual track. You'll have some executive action that he can take and that will uh, work to enact H.R. 2 and give him the, the legislative appropriated support for both our men and women in uniform, Customs and Border Patrol, TSA, Homeland Security, the border uh, security barriers and the technology, because we've made a lot of progress. It's just that Joe Biden undid it all and created this avalanche of, of humans coming across our border. And I'm concerned about the ones that have nefarious uh, uh, impacts. And the other thing I just would mention about the Senate bill that I didn't touch on, which was a key frustrating element about the effort, is it said, well, we won't shut down the border if only 5,000 people uh, uh, present themselves daily. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. come on. I mean, that shouldn't, it shouldn't be a numeric thing. It should be, we're orderly 
running our border. If you have a reason to come in the United States, you come in. If you have a reason to seek asylum, no, you wait outside the border. This is my point. This is why even though the senators work mightily on that, and God bless James Lankford, who I have the highest respect for, uh, when it came to the Senate, to the House, it was just a, a dead issue because of that gap, I would say, in the structure of the bill. Well, I mean, and Jay Johnson, who was Obama's DHS chief, said a thousand border crossings a day is enough to put the system into chaos. And so so now we're saying 5,000 is going to be sort of the cap, which is absolutely, utterly ridiculous when you look at this in a historical perspective. Um, well, thank you so much for, for spending some, some, t- some of your time with us. We know that immigration, along with inflation, are the top one or two issues that voters are the most concerned about um, going into November. And it's very important that we elect representatives and a president who will keep our interests first and keep and keep us safe, knowing that this threat is is looming out there. And so I thank you for your work that on, on committees and keeping on top of this, holding the executive branch accountable, and then hopefully moving you know, past November, uh, getting some actual bills with teeth in them to, to stop, to stop, you know, the migrants from just walking across. Well, Kelly, thanks. We're going to stay in this fight. This is one of the most important things. Border security is national security. And that's certainly the strong view of Republicans in the House and Senate. Thanks for having me. Thank you.